This is Josh White with JW Math Tutoring, and today's video is going to focus on Digital SAT Practice Test 1, the Math Section, Module 2B. Or in other words, this is the harder or more difficult um, second module under the math portion of the SAT uh, that you would receive when taking the test. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the time for this video will most likely be longer than the allotted time that you have to complete this section. And that's because I like to show as many methods as possible to solve uh, some of the questions that you will come across on here. Uh, besides that, if you like this video, please do click the thumbs up on it and also subscribe to my channel and sign up for notifications as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and get right to it. But life is a dream the calculus could never predict. Just before uh, I begin this uh, section to uh, what I call module 2B, the math section from the digital SAT practice test number one. Uh, this is the, again, the harder of the, um, like, you know, of, of the two, like, second modules that you would get when you take uh, the math test. Uh, just a couple things to please keep in mind. Uh, first, I will show uh, several different solutions to many of these problems. Therefore, I will most likely go over the allotted time limit, you know, for the 22 questions that are part of this section. Uh, second of all, um, I'm actually working off a PDF version of this test rather than in the Blue Book app. So uh, just first of all, be aware of that. Second of all, I do have, um, you know, the Desmos calculator um, basically loaded on the screen uh, just to, you know, use as well, because obviously that's not built into OneNote, which is where the PDF is. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind. I'm still going to go through and do the calculations using uh, the Desmos calculator that's, you know, should be uh, very similar to the one that's included in the Blue Book app. And the third thing, of course, if you like this video and my other videos, please do click the thumbs up and also uh, subscribe to my channel and sign up for notifications. All right, so with that being said, we'll go ahead now and finally get started with question number one. Uh, this is just a basic uh, combining uh, like terms problem. So all we're going to do is just combine here the 9x squared and the 7x squared. Uh, that will equal 16x squared, and then we still also have the 9x with it, so the correct answer for this is just letter D. Next question, number two. So we have 900,000 beads, and we have 828,000 or silver. What percentage are silver? So this is just a very... Uh, simple question, we just take, you know, the 828,000, divide that by 900,000. I mean, all the zeros cancel out, so you're really doing 828 divided by 900. You just do that on the calculator, it comes out to 0.92, and that is just equivalent to 92%. So again, correct answer is going to be letter D. Now, for problem number three, uh, here we have a uh, basically grid in or a student produced response question. So they're asking for the value of 3t here. There are multiple ways you could do this. So first thing you do want to do is uh, most likely go ahead and distribute on the left side. So you get 6t minus 20 and then plus t and then on the right side you get 40 plus 4t and now you could combine like terms and get 7t minus 20 equals 40 plus 4t. And then at this point, uh, I'm going to collect the t's on the left and numbers on the right. So I'm going to add 20 to both sides, and I'm going to subtract 4t on both sides. That's going to give me 3t equals 60. Notice this is the answer to the question. The answer is 60. But if you didn't recognize that or whatever you forgot, you know, just instinctively solve for t, you would get t equals 20. Just remember then that you want 3t, so you have to do, you know, 3 times 20, which is, of course, 60. All right, moving on to, uh, sorry, just so we can see, see the full work there. All right, moving on to the next question, number four. Here we have um, a very similar question where they have 
uh, an equation and they ask you not for the value of x but for in this case x plus 4. So a couple of things. First, uh, with this problem, the quickest, easiest way to do this is to notice that technically you can subtract 4 times x plus 4 as just like one expression from both sides. And then on the left, you have five of them. On the, and so when you subtract four of them from it, you would be left with just one x plus 4. And that's equal to 29, and that's your answer. So correct answer is letter C. However, if you didn't recognize that, if you, you know, didn't know how to do that, that's fine. Uh, then what I would do is I would go ahead and I would multiply out on the left and get 5x plus 20 and distribute on the right 4x plus 16 plus 29. I would combine the 16 and the 29 into 45. And now go ahead and solve for x. So minus 4x on both sides, minus 20 on both sides. You should get... Uh, x equal to 25. Therefore, x plus 4 is just going to be 25 plus 4, which is just equal to 29. So get the same answer. It's a little bit more work, um, but not that much work. All right, now, uh, looking at the next problem, number 5. Here you have uh, basically an equation that they give you with two variables in an x and y, and they want to know what x represents in this equation. So notice that here, 3, 9, 3, 4 on the right represents total number of trees. Okay? They tell us that, you know, in the second sentence. Total number of trees is 39, 34. So that means these two quantities must also be a number of trees. Okay, so overall 2 times x will be a number of trees. So if the 2 represents hectares, which is technically an area, so you have 2, you know, which is an area, and it's going to be multiplied by something, which is x, and we want the final answer to be number of trees. Basically, what we're going to need, if you look at the units, we're going to need area to cancel out. So area is going to have to be on the bottom, and we're going to need trees on top. Because in the end, we need to know how many total trees there will be. If we have the area, well, then we'd multiply that by, I guess you could kind of call it the density, or the number of trees per the area or per hectare in the park. So, correct answer for this one is going to be letter A. And of course, notice that uh, it is A because the 2 corresponds to the area of the park, whereas the 35 is for the residential area. You know, that's why it's not B, because B talks about number of trees um, per hectare in the residential area. All right, for number 6. We have a rectangle. We know that ratio of its length to width is 35 to 10. Um, doesn't have to be those exact numbers, but you know whatever we can just use them right now. Draw a picture. Okay. Then we know if the width increases by seven, how much must the length by uh, how much must the length change by to maintain this ratio? So there are multiple ways you could do this one. You could, uh, so first of all, notice that the new one would be 17 if we increase the width by 7, and therefore, you know, this new length would be x. And so, okay, <coughs> multiple ways you could do this. You could set up a proportion, which would be, say, 35 over 10 equals x over 17. And then you could go ahead and you could solve that. So, if you actually work this out, uh, let's see, 35 times 17, or excuse, uh, yeah, 35 times 17, 595, so we get 10x equals 595, that means x is just going to be 59.5, 
notice it wants to know how much you must change the length by or increase it. So the answer is really going to be the 59.5 minus 35, which is 24.5. So that is one method used to solve this. Another method would just be basically back solving. And the easiest way to do this with back solving is, first of all, notice that the ratio of length to width is 3.5 to 1. In other words, to get from here to here, it's like times three and a half, right? Um, so if you would go with back solving, I mean, first of all, you should be able to get rid of the decreasing ones right away because if you increase the width, obviously the length is going to increase as well. Then you only have two cho uh, choices to check. So you would do 35 plus 24 and a half, 59.5, and then see, okay, does 17 times 3.5 equal 59.5? Okay, the answer is yes, and that would make it correct. And if you tried 7, you know, 35 plus 7 is 42. 17 times 3.5 is not 42. So you could also technically um, back solve this one as well. All right, number 7. Here we have a formula. It's got two letters in it. And it basically wants to express n in terms of p. So you're just solving for n, um, you know, in terms of p. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by n because that's in the denominator. And that will get rid of all the fractions. And that will give me basically np equals 9n plus 14. Now we need to get both the n terms on the same side. So now I'm going to go ahead and subtract by 9n on both sides. I get np minus 9n, that's equal to 14. Then I'm going to factor out an n uh, because that's what you have to do when you have two terms with the same variable that you're solving for that do not, um, basically that cannot be combined. Um, like here, the, the np and the 9n. And then just divide by p minus 9. So final answer, I get n equals 14 over p minus 9. Correct answer is going to be letter D. Now, you could also solve this using picking numbers, and I'll just briefly show you how that would work. So I'm going to let n equal 1, all right? And if I plug that in, then p is equal to 9 plus 14 over 1. Well, 14 over 1 is just 14. 9 plus 14, p is 23. So now... I take my p-value of 23, I plug it into all these answer choices, and I see which of these answer choices makes n equal to 1. So for the first one, 23 minus 9 is 14. Uh, four, er, 14 over 14 is 1, so that one checks, so we keep it. For the second one, 23 divided by 14 is like 1.8 something, 1.7. That plus 9 is not 1. Get rid of it. Uh, here, 23 divided by 14, same thing, minus 9. That's going to be a negative number. Get rid of it. And for D, 23 minus 9 is 14. 14 divided by 14 is 1. So initially, you would have two possible uh, correct answers. So then you'd have to redo it to choose between these two. So now I would choose N equals 2. That's going to make P equal to 9 plus 14 divided by 2, which is 7. So P is 16. Now when I plug this in, for A, 16 minus 9 is 7 over 14, or 1 half. That is wrong. That is not equal to 2. And down here, 16 minus 9 is 7. 14 divided by 7 is 2. That checks. That's correct. It confirms, you know, letter D is the correct answer. All right, for number 8, uh, they want to basically here equate two different expressions to each other and find what the value of B has to be. So... What you uh, need to notice in this one is that basically if you take the top, you factor out a 6 as a common factor on the bottom, and then basically notice that 4 times 6 is 24. And so then we take the x plus b and we multiply it by 6, and that the, the 6 in front matches. So if we match everything up now, you know, we take the expression on the right, the 4 over x plus b, we multiply it by 6. It matches the expression I left identically. We have a 6 in front, we have an x, we have a plus, and then b has to be 7. So the correct answer for this one is just letter A, 7.
Now for question number nine. Um, here they give us the equation of a circle. Okay, uh, so uh, the, one, the radius circle B is two times the radius circle A. What does K have to be in the standard form equation for circle B? So hopefully you remember standard form equation of a circle, X minus H player squared plus Y minus K squared equals R squared. Therefore, for circle A, R squared is 4, which means R is the square root of that, which is 2. Circle B, the radius will be 2 times that. So this is for A. Now for circle B, the radius will end up being 4. Therefore, the square of that will end up being 16. So K must be 16. So that's the answer you would grid in uh, for this problem. Alright, now for question number 10. Um, basically, what you're going to do here is essentially set up an equation because what's happening is you have uh, 81 total employees you know, who, who are each getting one chair and we are going to multiply uh, those 81 employees times the cost of the chairs but the other thing is we have to multiply by 1.07 to account for the sales tax, I'll explain why in a second and then we set that equal to fourteen thousand dollars. Or you could, if you wanted to, you could technically set it equal to like less than fourteen thousand um, dollars, because uh, <coughs> you want, um, you know, basically like you want it to be less than that amount. I mean, it's not going to work out that it's exactly that amount, but either way. So the reason that uh, we multiply this by 1.07 to account for the sales tax is because we want um, basically like the cost of the chair we want that we multiply by 81 that's the total cost of 81 chairs and then we have to technically multiply that cost by 0 0.07 because the sales tax is 7% but Whenever you have a sales tax, like you take something and you multiply it by the percentage, so like 0 0.07, then you add it to the original amount. What ends up happening is you're really just uh, multiplying by one point and then whatever the sales tax is, you know, as a decimal. That's just like the shortcut or shorthand way um, to do it. So now you can go ahead and you could solve this equation. So on the left side, if you do the 81 times 1.07, it just comes out to 86.6, you know, 667. Um, the sixes end up repeating. And then that's, and we, of course, we have the X, which is the price of the chair. Just divide both sides by that. What you're going to get is basically 161.532, which, of course, you would round off to 161.53. Uh, so the correct answer for this one is going to be letter B. Now, it's probably, honestly, uh, quicker and easier on this to just go ahead and back solve it. And so what I mean by that is, take your answer choices, basically, uh, say the cost of a chair, multiply it by the sales tax rate, multiply that by 81, okay? And then you're going to see, basically, you want to get as close as possible to 14,000. So the first one is like still a little bit under it. So now I'm going to move on to the second one, 161.53. Notice that one's very, very, very close, 13,999. Okay, now I will try the next one, which will probably send me over, 172.84. Okay, and now it's over the budget. So that tells us 161.53 is the, um, you know, the correct answer. Alright, for this question we have a system of equations and uh, they want to know basically what is a possible value of x. So this one is not uh, going to be two lines because notice the second equation has an x squared in it, um, but that's fine. We can still solve this um, by doing a little substitution and then also using the Desmos app. So 
you take the second equation and you solve it for y, you should get 2x squared minus 341. Now you can take that and you can plug it into y in the first equation. 8x plus 2x squared minus 341 equals negative 11. So, okay, now if you want to go ahead and solve this, and I'm going to go through all the work, even though it's going to be way quicker and easier to do it on Desmos, which I'll show you, you know, just as soon as I'm done here. 2x squared plus 8x, you want to add 11 to both sides, which makes it minus 330 equals 0. Technically here, you can divide everything by 2, just to make the numbers a little smaller. And you get x squared plus 4x minus, um, let's see, uh, what is it, 165. Okay, and that's equal to 0. This is actually going to be factorable. It's going to be x plus 15 and x minus 11. So your two answers are going to be 11 and negative 15. So be careful here. Notice, positive 11 and negative 15. So we see negative 15. Correct answer is going to be letter A. Notice B is wrong. It is negative 11. That is not a value that we have for this one. Now, going to be so much quicker and so much easier though to do this on uh, the Desmos calculator. So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and just graph the first line and notice you do not even need to, I'm going to zoom out here, uh, rearrange it or put it into you know standard form or, or I mean into um, slope intercept form. You don't even need to solve it for y. You can just type it in as is. Alright so notice here we have uh, two possible points of intersection. So one of them is right up here. Okay, negative 15. So that is one of the answers, and that just confirms that that's the correct one. The other possible answer is down here. Notice it's like positive 11. Scanning the answer choices, we do not see positive 11 anywhere. So again, much quicker, much easier to just graph both of these out, look for the intersection points, and decide which one um, is correct. Moving on to the next question here, uh, number 12. We have basically a linear equation, and you want to know how many solutions it has. So one thing just to be aware of is whenever you have any type of linear equation, you know, where there's just x's and numbers, uh, it will never have exactly two solutions. It's either going to be one solution, uh, infinitely many, which is, you know, all real numbers, or zero solutions, i.e. no solution. So if you just go ahead and distribute on both sides here, you should get 150x minus 90 equals negative 90 plus 150x. Now if you rearrange the right side, you should notice that we have the same x terms on the left and the same number term on the left and the right and the same number terms on the left and the right. In other words, we have identical expressions. So this will turn out to be all real numbers or infinite solutions. So the correct answer is going to be letter C. Now, just to show you exactly you know why that happens, so basically notice how if you cancel out the x's, you know, subtract 150x on both sides, cancels, cancels, okay, we get negative 90 equals negative 90. Now, if you add 90 to both sides, notice you get 0 equals 0. So, whenever you have a linear equation and all of the variables, i.e. the x's, cancel out or drop out and you're left with the same number equal to itself, it is infinite solutions. If Now, however, if this problem happened to work out where we had two different numbers equal to each other, like say, just hypothetically, the number on the right, you know, was like plus 90 here instead of negative 90, okay? And everything else was the same. So down at the very end here, you would get negative 90 equals positive 90, or in other words, you would get technically get 0 equals 180. Then it would be no solution. In other words, all the variables cancel out and you're left with two different numbers equal to each other that are not equal. Okay? But for this example problem, it is infinite solutions or all real numbers. Next up, problem 13. Uh, here we have a quadratic function. They give us the vertex. They give us um, the x-intercept or one of the x-intercepts and they ask what the other one is. So there are actually multiple ways you could do this. Uh, the straight, I guess, but I say the traditional way to do this is basically to notice that when you graph 
a quadratic function just get this out of here okay so we know the vertex is negative 3 6 okay so that's like something up here negative 3 6 just whatever just an estimate and okay one of the x-intercepts is negative 17 4 to come 0 so notice negative 17 over 4 if you just go to a calculator um, go to Desmos, whatever, divide that, it's like negative 4.25. So that means it's going to be over here somewhere, okay? Negative 17 over 4. So uh, what you could do now is basically find the x distance between the x uh, coordinates the horizontal distance between the x-coordinates of the vertex and this x-intercept. Because the distance from here to here will be exactly the same as the distance from here to the other intercept because they are symmetric. You know, basically a quadratic function is symmetric on either side of the vertex. So the way I would find the distance between these two values is I would do basically negative 3 minus negative 17 fourths and that turns into negative 3 plus 17 over 4 now you could get a common denominator to this it's negative 12 over 4 and then you add it blah blah anyways it turns out to be 5 over 4 or as a decimal 1.25 again you could do all that in Desmos um, or on your calculator if you have a calculator with you so that means this x-intercept is 1.25 units to the left of the vertex Therefore, the other x-intercept will be 1.25 units to the right of the vertex. So I'm going to start at the negative 3. I'm going to move 1.25 or 5 fourths, whichever one you want to use, to the right. And that's going to give me um, the value of the other x-coordinate value of the other x-intercept. So it's going to be negative 1.75 or as a fraction, it's negative 7 over 4. So the correct answer for this one is going to be letter B. Now, an alternate way to do this would be to go to Desmos, type in the equation for this quadratic function. It's going to be x minus h, so it's x minus negative 3, which is really x plus 3. So Whatever, I'll just make it plus 3. And then uh, k is plus 6. Okay, so what we have here is the, uh, equ the equation for this function in vertex form. And I'm just going to add a slider for the a value in front. And now what I'm going to do is basically... I don't know if I'm going to get the exact value, but I'm going to get an answer that's close enough to the existing y-intercept, excuse me, x-intercept, to figure out which of these other ones makes sense. So what I mean by that is, let me zoom in here. Okay, so I want, I know that one of the x-intercepts is negative 17 over 4, or negative uh, 4 and 1 fourth, negative 4.25. Uh, okay? Negative 17 over 4, just if you divide it, it's negative 4.25. Okay, so now I'm going to adjust this slider until I see an, uh, an x-intercept here, which is right, looks to be right on negative 4.25. So if I go here, notice, okay, this is negative 4.5, uh, negative 4.549. So I got to go a little bit more to like halfway between. So like maybe right around here. Let's see. Okay, negative 4.257. Notice it's not exact, but it's close enough because these answers are far enough apart that we just need an approximate value for the other one. So notice the other one is negative 1.743. Okay. So when you go through these answers, notice it's obviously not C or D because those are positive values, right? So now you're checking A versus B. Well, A is negative 29 over 4. Now, if that's going to be like negative 7 something. I mean, if you're not sure, you know, you can just divide that 
you know, on your calculator on Desmos and you see that's clearly wrong. Um, so B has to be the correct answer. Now, one last thing also to keep in mind about this problem. If you use process of elimination like I just did, you can actually determine that it's B without even needing to calculate or figure anything out. And it's basically just what I just said. If you draw the graph, whether on Desmos or just by hand, right, and you sketch it out, you have the vertex here at negative 3, 6. This x-intercept will be to the left of it, you know, right here, negative 4.25 comma 0. The other x-intercept has to be to the right of it, okay? So you know that A is out because A is like way over here to the left at like negative, you know, 7 point something, 7.25. Um, so now you could technically eliminate that one right away, and then you could, um, for these three, which are all to the right of it, I mean, then you would have to use some type of, you know, estimation to figure out that B is the one that makes sense, whereas the other two are just going to be way too far over, um, you know, and not uh, symmetric. Okay. Let's continue now. Uh, another problem that deals with a graph here, number 14. So... <coughs> This problem is uh, one that you see a lot on the regular paper SAT that you know still currently exists in the U.S. Um, basically, they give you here the function, the graph of a function, but with a translation applied to it. Okay, in this case, it's a vertical shift up 14 units, and then they ask, "What's the actual equation of the function itself?" So there are two ways you could do this one. Okay, one way that you could do this is you could basically notice that uh, we have the original, uh, we have here, you know, f of x plus 14, right, that we have the graph of. So that means this line has been shifted up 14 units. So if you move all the points down 14 units, i.e. subtract 14 from every y value, while well, the 2 would go down here to like, you know, whatever, negative 12. And thus, <coughs> you would end up with a y-intercept of 0, comma negative 12. Okay? Notice that there's only one. First of all, these all have the same slope, so that's not something to differentiate them. It's only the y-intercepts that are different. So, therefore, A is going to be the choice that has the value of negative 12. Now, an alternate way to think about this would be to kind of do the reverse, which is to say, okay, all of our answer choices here, we have functions f of x, right? Now, if we shift them up 14 units, i.e., if we add 14 to all of these, then we will get equations which should equal this line that we see right here, which is f of x plus 14. So when we add 14 to all of them, they all become negative 1 fourth x and then plus 2, plus 30, plus 6, um, looks like 0. So now when you look at all these equations for lines, you know, which of these new equations matches the graph that you actually see on uh, the screen here, okay? It's obviously the first one, negative 1 fourth x plus 2, you know, because you can clearly see the y-intercept is 2 here. So there's two different ways to think about this one, um, but both of them should lead you to letter A. Next up, problem number 15, uh, we have a quadratic function, but one of the values, uh, coefficients in it is not known. It's B, um, and they basically want to know what its value is going to be in order for this equation to have more than one real solution. First, I will show you the quote-unquote traditional way to solve this, you know, by hand, and then I will show you a much quicker, simpler, easy way to use the Desmos, um, you know, onboard uh, graphing calculator. So the traditional way to solve this would be to remember that the uh, discriminant of the quadratic formula, in other words, the b squared minus 4ac part, will give uh, more than one real solution, i.e. two real solutions, when it is uh, greater than zero, okay, when it's positive. So basically, if you just plug the values in here, so b is really just the same letter, b in the problem, and then minus 4 times 64 times 25, that uh, will come out to equal 6,400. So you have b squared minus 6,400 is greater than 0. Or in other words, b squared is greater than 6,400. This is technically now a quadratic inequality. 
the way you solve this is you set it equal to zero and then you would solve that by square rooting both sides you get either plus or minus 80 so those are your two like what are called cut points or critical points and then you basically make a number line so we have uh, negative 80 we have positive 80 those are the two spots where it's equal to exactly zero and then over here we have like you know b squared minus 6400 and you pick test points for each of the things and you see is it positive negative or whatever okay so if you pick a point in the middle which is zero okay and plug it in zero squared is obviously zero zero minus 6400 is obviously a negative value and then if you pick numbers on the outside, they're going to be positive, okay? You could pick positive 81 and plug it in, and you could pick negative 81 and plug it in. And because they square, you know, they still comes out positive, and then you subtract it, it will be greater than zero. Therefore, the values which you would plug in for B here that um, make this entire expression greater than zero or positive are going to be these here and these over here. So when we look at the answer choices, uh, which numbers are either greater than positive 80 or less than negative 80? It is A, negative 91. Okay, so that's kind of like the traditional way you would solve this. However, here is a much quicker, simpler, faster, easier way using uh, the Desmos onboard calculator. So let me clear this out. Again, we are going to use the slider. Or actually, we don't even need to do that. Um, what I would do is I would just plug in the numbers. This is basically back solving. So we've got 64x squared minus, and I'm going to put in for B, negative 91x plus 25. Now, are there more than one real solution in this for this specific equation, for this graph? The answer is yes, because the solutions or the zeros or the roots or the x-intercepts, those are all the same thing, you know, will be here, right here at 0.372, and it looks like there's another one here at 1.05. So there are, basically you're looking for the number of places that the graph crosses the x-axis. That's the number of solutions. So we already have our answer here, and you could test out the others and see that the answer is going to be uh, incorrect. So when you plug in negative 80, it actually has one real solution, but that is not more than one, which is what the problem's asking for. If you plug in positive five, uh, does it cross here? Let's see, it looks like no. Yeah, see it's way up here. I mean, just zoom out to find it. The vertex is way up here, like 0, 25. Um, it does not cross the axis at all, so it does not have more than one real solution, and the same thing's gonna happen with 40, okay? Vertex shifts, changes a little bit here, but still, it does not cross the x-axis at all. Therefore, it does not have any real solutions. They're technically only complex solutions. So again, answer is A. Much quicker and easier way to solve this is using the uh, onboard calculator. All right, problem number 16. Here we have a graph of a line that we're given. And we're also told... Um, about its x and y intercepts and then it wants to know just what the value of uh, you know a over b is so basically all we have to do here is solve for the x-intercept solve for the y-intercept and then get those answers and divide them so you can plug in 0 for x and that will give you the y-intercept so the y-intercept is going to be basically negative 31 over 2. Um, you can plug in 0 for y. That will give you the x-intercept. So that's going to be negative 31 over 7. And it wants to know the value of b over a. Okay, so b is the y-intercept value. So this is b, this is a. So we've got negative 31 over 2 over negative 31 over 7. This you could just do on Desmos, but if you do the fraction division, it's going to be like this and then when we do state change flip uh, we will flip this and change it to multiplication so the 7 will go on top the 31 goes on the bottom 31's cancel out the two negatives cancel to make positive and we get 7 over 2 one other thing just to point out is that you could easily get um, the 
equations, or the, excuse me, the intercepts, both the x and the y intercept from, uh, for this line, from the calculator in Desmos. So we could do 7x plus 2y equals negative 31. Okay, and we can easily see right here, okay, it's negative 4.429, um, and that's fine. You know, we can just jot that down. That's going to be A. And then B, let's see, where is it going to be right here? Looks like negative 15.5. Okay, so we would just go to the calculator. Divide negative 15.5 by negative 4.429. Okay, it comes out to like 3.499966. And the point is, it doesn't like it doesn't have to be exact. You know, the fact that it doesn't, you know, we don't have the fraction. That's fine. We look at these answer choices. Okay, the negative's obviously out. Um, you know. Is 2 divided by 7 equal to 3.499? No, obviously not. It's going to be D, again, 7 over 2. So, again, much quicker, easier way, most likely, is to just use the onboard, you know, graphing calculator to get both intercepts and then just to divide the numbers and go from there. All right, next up, we have problem number 17. So, here you have basically a system of linear equations and they tell you that it has no solution and they, but they want to know what is the value of t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first get both of these into standard form, meaning all the x and y terms on one side and the number values on the left. Um, it's going to be much easier to see after that. Okay, so minus 10y so the first one's going to be 4x minus 16y equals 2. Next one, um, I am going to subtract the 2x over. So I'm going to get minus 2x plus ty equals uh, 1 half. So now, for a system to have no solution, the multiples, or the multipliers I call them, the basically the scale factor, from for the x terms has to be the same as it is for the y's but it has to be different than whatever the number terms are so what I mean by that is okay here we have a 4 and we end up with a negative 2 say going from top to bottom so you could think of that as to get from 4 to negative 2 we just divide by negative 2 or multiply by one, negative one half. Okay, either way, however you want to think about it. So for the y's, it has to be the same. Okay, so that means we have negative 16. We divide that by negative 2, and that's going to give us positive 8. Therefore, the correct answer to this problem has to be 8. Now, the reason it's no solution is because when you look on the right side, to get from 2 to 1 half, you're technically dividing by 4 or multiplying by 1 fourth, however you want to think about it. So the left side is divided by negative 2, negative 2. The right side is dividing by positive 4. So that's why it's no solution. But the key is the x's and the y's have to have the same multiplier. Now, you could also try, uh, you could also solve this one on the graphing uh you know, the graphing uh, calculator in Desmos. So I'm going to put in the first one. And then I'm going to put in the second one. And it's going to get the slider. Okay, and now I'll add the slider for T. So what we're going to do is basically, let me just zoom out here. Okay, so right now they're intersecting, right? Obviously, that's not what we want. Uh, we want, but for no solution, we want the two lines to be parallel. So you can try moving the slider in either direction. Notice how when you go here, negative, they, they intersect all the way up to negative 10. So that's probably not going to help us. So what about if I go here? 
to the positives Now, the problem or the thing that's really tricky about this one is like they are really, really close and have very, very similar y-intercepts. So it's like when the thing starts out, say it starts out at zero, like you can see here obviously that they're, you know, um, intersecting. Okay, and then as we keep rotating, notice eventually we keep going. Now here at 7, you might think they're parallel, but again, notice they still intersect over here. So you have to keep going, and eventually it's going to be 8. And then if you kept going, you would see that the top end started to get closer. So you could do this. Um, it would not be you know, a foolproof method, though, because you don't know if the answer like could somehow be 8.1 versus 8.2. I mean, we know that it's not, but that's always a possibility on a, uh, you know, a grid-in non-multiple choice problem basically. So that's another method you could use to check it um, you know besides actually you know figuring out the multipliers. Alright next up uh, problem number 18. Here we have uh, basically a little geometry type problem. We have an isosceles right triangle so that means it's also technically 45, 45, 90 because it's isosceles, because the two legs are the same length. Hypotenuse is 58. What is the perimeter? So two ways you could find out the lengths of each of the legs. If you know the special right triangle formulas, you could take 58 and divide it by square root of 2. Now, to simplify that, you're just going to multiply by root 2 over itself. So it's going to be 58 root 2 over 2, which will just turn into 29 root 2. So each of these is 29 root 2. And now for the perimeter, you add them all up. So 29 root 2, 29 root 2, that is 58 root 2. And then you also have the hypotenuse of 58. Those cannot combine. They're not like terms. So the correct answer for this is going to be letter C. An alternate method you could use if you did not remember the special right triangle formulas is to just use Pythagorean theorem. So it's basically you know, going to be like x squared plus x squared equals 58 um, because... A and B are both uh, equal to each other. So then you get 2x squared equals 58, x squared equals 29, x equals, uh, this, excuse me, it should be 58 squared. Um, so 2x squared should be, uh, let's see here, equal to 33.64, not 58. Then dividing that by 2, 1682 for x squared. Now the problem is you probably don't know like how to simplify this. I mean, you meaning it's going to be a pain to realize that this is equal to 29 square root 2. However, let's just say you like square root this and you get its decimal, right? Okay, it's 41.012. So now, all right. Um, what you'd have to do is basically now you'd say okay the perimeter is going to be 41.012 add that to itself it's 82.024 plus the 58 okay so I add 58 to that I get like 140.024 alright that's my final total perimeter like as a decimal and then what you go through do is go through the answers and find the decimal equivalents for all them and find out which one equals 140.024. So, you know, you just type in 29 square root 2. That obviously is not, that's the 41.012 we already got, you know. And then this one is going to be equal to the 82.024, uh, choice B. So that's wrong. C is the one that's going to be correct. And then D, if you go ahead and add it up, you know, it's going to be way um, too large. It's not going to be equal to 140.024. So that's an alternate way you could do this. Um you know, if you don't remember the special right triangle formulas. All right, next up we have problem number 19. So on this one, you are given a table of values here. 
and it says we have a linear function, you know, y equals mx plus b. Um, and they want to know the value of a minus b, where a is the slope, basically, and b is the y-intercept. Okay, so first of all, it's easy enough to find the slope. You know, just plug in, like, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm just going to do 64 minus 0 over 3 minus 2. Okay, so that is m, which is the slope, or in this problem, that is actually the value of a. And now to find the value of b, there are multiple ways uh, that you could do it. You could notice that, like, as you move to the left here, each y value goes down by 64. So if this thing is 0, and then you subtract another 64, it'd be negative 128. But if you didn't recognize that, that's fine. You could just go y equals mx plus b, and I would pick the point uh, 2 comma 0. So 64 times 2 uh, goes in for x plus b. 0 equals 128 plus b. b is equal to negative 128, OK? So now, what's a minus b? Well, it's 64 minus negative 128. 64 plus 128. Correct answer for this one is going to be letter D, 192. Okay, and we have our, um, you know, answer right here. Now, for problem 20, uh, this is one of the trickier questions on this specific. Uh, test. So you have a data set. It has 10 integers. They're all less than 60, so every, everything up to 59. Uh, the first nine are shown here, okay? The mean of these nine integers is 42. You can, like, double check that if you want to, um, but it is. So now it wants to know if the mean of A which is the all 10 integers, you know, including the one that's missing, is greater than 42, i.e. the mean increases by adding another number in, like, what's the value of the largest integer from data set A? So, okay, 42 is the mean. You multiply that by the total number of items. That gives you the sum of all these items, which, I mean, you could just add them up yourself anyways. It's 378, right? So what you're going to notice is basically now to get the new mean, right, you're going to have to divide by 10. So whatever all these n 10 numbers add up to is going to have to end in a 0. So, I mean, you could just do basically like, you know, essentially like back solving it, where say you start with uh, whatever, 43. You know, if you pick, if it, the numbers, if the tenth number is 42, then the mean's not going to change. So we know that's out. But it's like if you started with 43, uh, notice that the value you would get would be 421. Okay? But 421 divided by 10 is not an integer. Also notice that they're asking what the value of the largest integer from A is. So 43, if I chose that for my 10th value, well, that would not be the largest integer. So in other words, I have to start with the largest possible numbers and work my way down, i.e., if I started with 59 and I added that to 378, you know, that would be 437. But again, when you divide that by 10, that mean, that average, is not an integer. It's 43.7. So hopefully you notice that like the number you will need for the sum on top is going to have to be 430 because when you divide that by 10, that will be 43 exactly, which is an integer. So therefore, the number for the largest value, you know, for this data set A, it's just going to be what do you add to 378 to make 430? And that value is just going to be 52. And so that's your correct answer. That's what you would grid in. Now, you could also get there again by doing trial and error. Just try 59, try 58, try 57, 56, 55, blah, blah. And eventually, you'll see 52 is the one that gives you um, a sum which will divide by 10 evenly. All right, question number 21. Uh, next to last question on this test. So here... You're asked to come up with this function that describes basically the situation where they charge a certain dollar amount for the first 25 people, and then they charge a different dollar amount for the people after that. So 
the way you would model this is you have to think, okay, the first 25 people all pay $21, okay? So the first 25 people pay $21, so whatever that, so then if there's people over 25, so like person 26, 27, below 28, those people would pay 14. Now, we want one, we're not going to use N for those people, but we have to basically take our N, which is the total number of people, and subtract 25 from that to account for the first 25 that already like fit into this first number here. So the number over 25, which is N minus 25, that's what would be multiplied by the 14. So the entire expression is going to look, you know, something like this. And then you should just go ahead and multiply this out and you're going to get, uh, let's see here, this is going to be 525, then it's going to be 14N minus 350. And that's just going to simplify to 14N uh, plus 175. So the correct answer for this one is going to be letter A. Also note, you could do this one using back solving. So, for example, let's say there are going to be 26 people, right? So I know that the total cost would be 21 times 25 and then plus one more person at 14. So if you just multiply that out, 21 times 25 and then add 14, it's going to be $539, okay, for 26 people. Go down through all these answer choices, plug in 26, the, you should see that the first one is the only one that gives you 539. If you do it to the second one, you get 889, which is way too high. If you do it to the third one, you would get 560, which is not correct. It's a little bit too high. And if you do it to the third one, it's obviously going to be uh, way too low. It's going to be 385. Okay, so you could also do this one by back solving where you pick the number of people, determine what the cost would have to be, and then plug that number of people into the formula to see which one gives you that uh, cost that you, you know, calculated. Okay, the last question here is, uh, on this section, is number 22, um, and it deals with some geometry. You have two triangles, you have LMN, so I'm just going to draw a picture here, LMN, okay, L is 60 degrees, LN is 10, then we have RST, it's going to look something like this, we know R is 60 degrees, and we know RT is 30. Okay. And now it says, which additional piece of information uh, do we need to prove that the two triangles are similar? So, uh, just real quick, there are three methods you can use to prove two triangles similar. There is AA, which is two pairs of congruent angles. There's SAS, two pairs of proportional sides and an included pair of congruent angles. And there is SSS, all three pairs of sides proportional. So, if you notice what happens, um, with A and B, okay, in A, MN is 7 and ST is 7. So in the picture, uh, we have a couple things here. First of all, the pair of angles we have congruent is not like included or between these two pairs of sides. And second of all, the sides are not proportional. Like one of them, the scale factor is like 3 to 1 or 1 to 3, however you want to look at it. But on the other one, the scale factor is one to one. Okay, so like that doesn't make you would have to have the same scale factor on all the sides. But it, the angle is not between them anyway, so that part automatically negates it. So this one's wrong. So now in B, again, even if you change this, so now the scale factors do match up, and they're both one to three. Again, the angle is not between the two pairs of proportional sides, so it's not SAS. Now if we look at C. Basically, they tell us that M is 70 and S is 60. So now if you fill in the rest of the angles, 
So t would also have to be 60, and it turned out then that this triangle would be equilateral, but n would have to be 50. And therefore, we only have one pair of congruent angles, the, so these triangles are not going to be similar. We need to have uh, at least two pairs of congruent angles. So now we're left with choice D by just process of elimination, but just to show you why this one is actually correct, you just uh, get rid of these angles here. Okay, so in this one, we now know M is 70 and T is 50. So now if you fill in the remaining angles, just by you know subtracting from 180, N would have to be 50 degrees, S would have to be 70 degrees, and therefore we now have at least two pairs of corresponding you know congruent angles. And so now we can use AA, and we can say that these two triangles are similar. All right, so that was uh, the digital SAT practice test one from the Blue Book app. Um, this is module two, specifically the harder uh, module, the two B, what I call the two B um, module. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about any of the problems solved here, please do leave them on the video below. Of course, if you like this video, uh, please do give it a thumbs up and also you know subscribe to my channel, sign up for notifications as well. And uh, I'll be back soon with more uh, SAT and ACT math related videos.